God about that sentence, about Jacob Bela. If you are interested in reading about him and you do not wish to wade through the complicated writings which he left behind, I would suggest two references. And I, I apologize that I haven't been doing this before, but it just occurred to me this morning that it might be a good idea. Um, the first reference is the mystic will, the mystic will uh, by Brenton, B-R-I-N-T-O-N, and Dr. Brenton is one of the the um, moving spirits directors, that's the word, of Pendle Hill, which is the Quaker School of Graduate Study where Dr. Phelps is lecturing during the summer. The Mystic Will by Brenton. It's a Macmillan book and it's out of print. But you can find it in almost any good secondhand bookstore uh, if you go there often enough over a long enough time interval. <laughs> the second reference is the um, Rufus Jones, Spiritual Reformers of the 14th Century, I think is the title of it. Spiritual Reformers is the title. Uh, that book also is out of print, but and you will not be fortunate enough to pick it up in a casual bookstore. You may pick it up in a highly specialized bookstore. I myself have been trying to find it for six years, but you still may be able to get it. Uh, in, in that study by Rufus Jones, there, there, is, there are three very crucial chapters on Jacob Burma. Now, this is, uh, th this is rather, it is rather difficult to interpret his mystical insight without becoming far more involved in aspects of the discussion which, from the point of view of our quest and our concern, are irrelevant. I would like to, therefore, begin by pointing up the central problem of mystical religion as that problem has expressed itself in our thought and then to see how the mind of a man like Burma moves in upon this problem and resolves it in a manner that seems to him to be very significant and resolves it in a manner that is so significant that he, perhaps more than any other person, may be regarded as the, the womb out of which Quakerism comes. There is, there is a tendency in the human spirit, more than a tendency, an activity of the human spirit that moves always outward towards the world of things, the world of matter. It seeks always to understand the individual thing, the particular thing, it is characteristic of our civilization, uh, our Western culture. We, we want to understand 
the world of nature and every aspect of the world of nature in order that we may be able from within the context of our understanding of nature control nature and make nature our servant. So ardent is this quest on our part and so successful have we been in the pursuit of the quest that pursuit in the quest that that the significance of the individual the man who is questing has been lost sight of it's very interesting I I was I saw a little skit on television uh, that, that arrested my mind and it, it I can't tell you how it ends because I've forgotten but it, and I blotted, I blacked out on it but it was it was a skit having to do with with what has happened to man and the machine perhaps some of you saw it all of the machines in the world suddenly decided that they would get rid of human beings they were tired of being pushed around by men so the typewriters that had been obeying these stenographers all day just decided that they would move on the offensive. And they ran all of the stenographers out of the offices. This, the, the wires and the, the, the um, telephones got tired of, of responding and being a tool of, of, of these human manipulators and these wires ran amok and began twisting and turning and getting out of hand and choking and destroying. They were tired of man's petty domination and the climax came when a man ran up three, four, five flights of stairs and staggered through a door on the roof and slammed the door and bolted because he was trying to escape the adding machine. <laughs> <laughs> but but, the, but the, the, the concept is, is very interesting. It's, it, it, it points out this, the thing that has happened in our, in, in the outgoing will. And that brings us to one of the insights of Burma, but we'll postpone it for a second. The way this outgoing will has, has sought always to understand the particular. And if I can understand enough particulars, then out of that understanding of this collection of particulars, I will therefore get a total understanding of the whole. And yet, the thing that blocks that is that there is a sense in which every particular though it may not be different from some other particular, yet it is unique in itself. And every time I hit one of these, I know that in order to be sure that my understanding, that my knowledge are complete, I must deal with every particular forever and ever, and I can't do that. With the result that the particulars begin to take me over. Now that's one push. Now the other push in the human spirit is to move back in the other direction. This is as old, of course, as, as the problems of philosophy having to do with the universal and the particular, the general and the specific and so forth. Now we move away from the world, borrowing always more deeply within, withdrawing until perhaps we come to 
some central core, some pulse out of which everything else emanates. But the problem always is, is that I, I cannot be aware that I'm there, that is, that I'm to this core, unless some part of me, some part of this outer, is along with me to inform me of the fact that it is different from the thing I'm experiencing. Do you see what I mean? No, you don't. Now, let, 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 let's, 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 let's try it again now. You, you see, when, when, we say, when we say, for instance, that, that, that I will withdraw from the world, which is, which is a part of the mystic, mystic's uh, insight, I will withdraw from the world and, and, and will become detached, detached more and more, so that, that there will be no thread that, of involvement at any point in order that I might plunge myself more deeply and utterly into the, the undifferentiated um, ground or... Um, I can't think of the word I want, but... Well, let me try it again. I hope you'll be patient. When I move from the outer to the inner, as long as there is some recollection of the outer in my experience, I can then be aware of the fact that I am aware of the inner. But if there is no outer with me, then I cannot be aware of the inner. To state it in terms of religion, I, I know that I must go before God. That I must be washed of all of the things that delimit my life. so that I can be utterly and completely acceptable in his sight. But if some part of me is not some part of thisness, is not with me in his presence, I cannot be identified. And I must be identified. Now, Jacob Burma wrestles with this problem. And he begins with a very interesting concept. I should say that his dates are 16th century, sometime after 1500. And he was a Lutheran. He was, he was a great uh, Protestant. Um, and he, he was a visionary. He had... Uh, he saw double all the time, you know, saw double, it's wonderful. And, and he, they thought he was a little strange, and yet there are many people in his period who felt that way because the times were uneasy times. And when, and when, when the times are uneasy times, then and then the stability of the human spirit has to be in, in the preciseness of its vision. Something has to hold and let, let the ebb and flow of the eventful vicissitudes do all the things they wish, but the vision holds. Now, he had these visions, uh, wrote down things, not because they were things that came out of his mind as such, but, but it, it is as if he was spoken through. He had, a, he had 
in, in a most amazing manner, he had a sense that, that he was exposed to the, to the very background of all existence, that, that he was in touch with, with the, the life out of which all things were evolved, all things were emanated, all things came so that, that always whatever he saw, whatever he was doing, he saw it both as the object at which he was looking or the object that he was experiencing and he saw it as that behind all objects, behind all existences. And he wrote some of these things down and, and got into trouble. They, they began, there was a, a certain Lutheran minister who, who read who read this and he said this, this man is dangerous and, and, and he went before the c town council and, and presented the, the case and uh, he, Burma was not even permitted to go home to tell his family goodbye. They just told him to just keep on going outside the city and he stayed out all night nowhere to sleep and then, then one of the men happened to read one of the things. And then when he read it, he, he saw, well, that's pretty good. You see, he, he had, uh, he'd been put out on the basis of, of the big lie. That's all. On the basis of the big lie. And he finally lost, however, because he was told not to write anymore. But he hadn't written in the first place. It had written in him. It's like the little boy who whistled in class and the teacher said, Johnny, did you whistle? No, I didn't whistle. It whistled itself. <laughs> well, it's, it's, that's the way he, that's the way that he wrote. So, so when these mere men said to him, under some band of, of being exiled, you must not write anymore, then he wanted to be a good citizen. He wanted to stay with his family and, and all the other things. And, and he said, well, all right, I'll do the best I can. And, and then he tried. But, but this tidal wave caught him and swept him out again. And he could not help himself, whatever may be the consequences. And so long after he, he was exiled, this, this man kept on uh, saying these very terrible things about him. And then finally... Uh, to pull his story together and go on with his concept. Um, when he died, and as a result of the prestige-bearing members of the states and princes, they felt that they'd have to give him a good... Uh, they'd have to be buried from the church. And at first they said, no, you can't bury him from the church. You can't do that. It, it defames the house of God to have this child of light buried from it. And, and the minister who had been opposing him all these years also died. Died, I think, before Burma. And his, his, assist, his successor, being true to his predecessor, wouldn't take the funeral. As a matter of fact, he got sick. So he could not make it. Now, he was persecuted, not because he was a bad man, and not because he was a good man, but because he was a man who had an insight that was out of step with his time. That's all. Not good, not bad. And the people who persecuted him were not bad people, nor were they good people. There were people who were doing the most natural thing in the world, and that is, hold what you have, because if you turn it loose, you may not get anything else. <laughs> and anybody who comes along to try to take it away from you, you'd better hold it. Now, that's his story in a nutshell. Now, how did he deal with the problem that I set up in the early part of our thinking together? 
There were two wills, says Burma, two wills. One will that goes out this way, goes out to man, to the world, to, to all aspects of life, and then there's a will that moves back towards the core. No man can understand, no man can understand anything in the world of phenomena, anything, anything in the world of experience. If all that he sees is what he's looking at, Now, if, if his knowledge is limited to that which is formal, discursive logic, then he deals always with half-truths. Reason, says he, is very important, but reason is very limited, for it can only deal with the externals or the multiplication of externals. It cannot deal with the inner relatedness of these manifestations. So, the clue then is that the individual must, as he experiences and deals with particular things in the world about him, must deal with them not as if they were ends in themselves, but he must deal with them doubly. He must see them as they seem, as they are seen by him as being at the moment of observation, but at the same time, he must see in them that of which the particular expression is but one tiny aspect. I self enter into contemplation and experience and ultimately hope that there will be blessed in my life the moment when I shall see God face to face with nothing between, not even my ego. Well, there's that tendency, you see. Now, when you apply this to ethics and human relations, then you get something very different. For he says, when I see a man, to put it in our language, when I see a man, I must apply to him what Burma calls creative imagination. And it is, and, and he means by that the insight that comes from the way the, the will moves back to the core and then from the core back out into the world, looking at the world from within the experience of the center. That's what he's talking about. Now, when I apply that to human beings, a very interesting thing happens. He says, when I see this man, I realize that he is a twig on a tree, a tree on which all of us are located. So that I see him both as John Jones, mean or not mean, beautiful or ugly, sick or well, that is the contextual point at which I relate to him. But all the time, with this other dimension of my vision, which he calls a creative imagination in the exercise of this other will, I see him 
as the fullest, most complete manifestation of his life. So that when I, when I, see, when I see a sick person, I see him sick, I read his temperature, I understand all of that with, with one lens. With the other lens, I see him well, whole, hale, hearty. And my ethical responsibility is to deal with him sick, limited, from the vantage point out here, whole, hail, complete. Do, 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 do you see what he's saying? It's a tremendous thing that I meet him here and see him there quite realistically and accurately, calling everything I see by, every, by, by the name that is most accurate. But at the same time, the point at which I really relate to him is at this point out here. Now, Burma says that if I do that, then I bring the sense of the whole to bear upon my relation to the man in the particular so that I deal with you, to state it in ordinary language now, I deal with you where you are, as you are, from within a meaning of you that is more than you are at that particular time. And by dealing with you in that way, I touch the core in you of which this thing out here that I see with my second vision is but a reflection. And I stimulate it. And it begins to grow and expand and take over, so that before my very eyes, again and again, the miracle takes place, that when, with this creative imagination that Burma talks about, I bring to bear upon this individual the fullest reach of my sense of the whole with reference to him, my love, as he calls it. Then before my very eyes, I see a miracle take place in him. It's very interesting, isn't it? How all of the finest minds that are working in the field of psychotherapy are saying exactly that thing. That when they get through analyzing and understanding what is, what is, it, what is wrong in this personality that is disturbed They say, if, if this sick mind could ever become aware that it is exposed to an enveloping whole love, And in its response to that love, it begins, the core 
begins to expand, blossom. And he's put his hands on a thing that we all feel in our own way. There's nobody in this room, upstairs or downstairs, who does not have somewhere lurking around in his spirit a hunger. A hunger to be completely and inclusively. saluted, cared for, loved, and in the magic of that vitalism, my spirit begins to stir And as it stirs, it sets up processes that wash me clean of my fears, of my insecurities, of all the things that choke my life. Burma says that it's possible for one human being to deal with another human being through this clumsy device that he uses, that Burma uses. From one point of view, clumsy, double vision, double view, seeing in time in circumstance, in vicissitude, but dealing with time, circumstance, vicissitude from a dimension outside of time, circumstance, and vicissitude. An awkward and simple way to say it, to walk on the earth by the light in the sky. And what a difference it makes. Whatever it happens to us. And how tremendous it must be to someone else when through us it happens to them. <laughs>